Thank you for joining us this evening. It's good to have our sanctuary choir uh, with us again after a well-deserved break. And so uh, we have obviously continued with our uh, Bible studies through the summer. That has been important to me uh, to do each one uh, each week uh, as opposed to going back and doing a rerun of something that we've done in the past. I can't say we have not done that, but uh, it, it's been important to me just to be here on Wednesday afternoons and recording the Bible study uh, in order for it to be online at 6.30, but uh, it's much better uh, to have warm bodies in the, in the pew. And so... For those that are joining us by Facebook and YouTube, uh, thank you for uh, being a part of our uh, Bible study. And I would tell you, if you've kept up with it, in the last uh, few weeks, I haven't really followed uh, any particular subject or any particular book. Uh, each week has been different, and uh, on most occasions, I start out thinking this is what, uh, what I want to focus on, and it seems like invariably the Lord leads in a different direction. And when I say in a different direction, I'm just talking about a wider direction uh, covering, and that is going to be true tonight. And I'm going to share uh, two verses with you from Acts chapter 9, but we're going to be looking at other verses uh, in the book of Acts, and after I read these verses and have prayer, I will tell you why uh, I just feel led uh, to go in this direction tonight. This is familiar to you, Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. And speaking of the apostle Paul, or Saul as he was then, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the goads. Father, thank you for the time together. We can always be blessed. We can always benefit when we open your word, even as we open our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for... Uh, this scripture, thank you that you recorded it uh, in the Holy Scriptures, and it is something that is important for us to know uh, because it has a message for us today as it has since the day it was written. And we pray uh, in this hour for uh, the grace of God, the Spirit of God, to be working in the lives of people who don't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because we know that uh, time is running out, uh, time is getting short, and the opportunities are going to be limited. And so the scripture is very clear to trust the Lord today while it is today because we know, know how many opportunities we'll have. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Thank you. We worship you in Jesus' loving name. Amen. As I started the study for our time uh, this evening, uh, my focus was really on uh, the conversion of Saul, who would become Paul. And uh, that was obviously a profound experience for him because uh, it's recorded three times in the book of Acts. And we know that uh, Paul was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. He had... Uh, the letter from the high priest giving him the authority to do that. And uh, one thing we have to admit, whatever the apostle Paul did, he did it with all his heart. He didn't play around. He didn't fool. He didn't mess around. He didn't do anything halfway. And before he became a Christian, he persecuted Christians with a vengeance. After he became a Christian, he pursued Christians with a passion. And so it was all out with him, 
It was really a matter of believe in it and put your heart and soul into it, fight for it with all your might, or forget about it. And uh, he wasn't one to forget about it. And so when I got into the study of that, I realized that the book of Acts is really one long record of people getting saved. And when I read this and going through this and just looking at uh, the times that the Lord worked in somebody's life and brought them to saving faith in Jesus Christ, I have to say there was a bit of envy in me because I'm wondering, why doesn't that happen today? Why can't we do that today? And I know that people are still being saved, uh, but I also know that it's not as many and not as fast as I would like. And uh, I'm like uh, the man said, his problem was that he was in a hurry and God wasn't. And so uh, when I look at the book of Acts, uh, I thought, boy, it's an, it's an exciting story about people who came to know the Lord. And with our, each every, and every one of them, it was a different circumstance. When uh, Paul uh, had his conversion experience, it certainly was not the first one. Because in chapter 4, when Peter preached that dynamic sermon, and the people came under conviction, and they really said to Peter, what must we do to be saved? And uh, he let them know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, repent, uh, change your mind. And when you change your mind, God will change your heart. And uh, we know that on that particular day, there were 5,000 people that came to know the Lord. I'd say that's a pretty good evangelistic day's work. And uh, so, but that wasn't the first one because in chapter 8, we know there's a man that's, we just know as the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip was the one to uh, find him sitting on a chariot reading from the book of Isaiah. And uh, Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless somebody shows me? And so Peter went uh, to him uh, and told him about how Jesus was uh, recorded in the, in the book of Isaiah. And he wanted to know, uh, apparently they were close to a body of water, and he said, what hinders me from being baptized? Peter said, well, Philip said, well, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, you can be. He said, I do. And he did. <laughs> uh, he was baptized right there. And so it's just a matter that you understand in the providence of God, he puts people together. He brings people together. And when I'm thinking about why are we not seeing more people today, maybe it's because uh, we're not really passionate uh, and pleading with the Lord about give me the opportunity to put somebody in my path today. Put somebody in my life that doesn't know the Lord and give me the opportunity to talk to them. But more than opportunity, give me the courage to talk to them. Because the fact of the matter is, uh, there are few things, if any, that scare believers more than the thought that you're going to have to talk to somebody about Christ. You're going to have to witness to somebody about the Lord. And so we need to ask the Lord to give us courage, give us grace, uh, give us the words to say, uh, give us, open the door, and, uh, and he will do that. And so, with that in mind, in chapter 10, there is another example of God doing uh, a mighty work in a special way. That is the house of Cornelius that comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And you do know uh, the story about Peter uh, going up on the rooftop 
Uh, and, uh, and by the way, on the way up the roof, uh, he had to pass a tanner uh, who, as far as the Jewish people were concerned, were engaged in the most disgusting work uh, because uh, they were not going to, and Peter will make this known later, uh, I've never eaten anything unclean. And so he goes to sleep, and while he's asleep, that uh, sheet of four corners with all manner of beasts on it are let down, and Peter was told to rise and eat. And he promptly let his prejudice be known. I have never uh, eaten anything like this. And God reminded him, what I have called clean, don't you call unclean. And so the door was open, and by the way, uh, at the same time, the Lord was working in Peter's life and, I don't want to say slapping him around a little bit, but getting his attention and bringing him to the place where he was going to be obedient to do what the Lord wanted him to do. The Lord was also working in the house of Cornelius, and apparently Cornelius, like a lot of people, knew about God. He knew, just didn't know about the Savior, Jesus Christ, or how to be saved. And so at the same time, uh, there are those, and the Lord is working with Peter. He's also working with, in the house of Cornelius because messengers are on the way from Cornelius to Peter and saying, hey, come over here. And so Peter does what the Lord asked him to do, reluctantly maybe at first, but he did it nonetheless. And the house of Cornelius uh, got saved. And there's no other way to say it. There's no better way to say it. And so you see uh, the seeds of salvation that are sown, and you see the harvest that is presented. You move on to chapter 16, and boy, what a, what a story that is. When the Philippian jailer gets saved. And I have to think that that all started because uh, the apostles are just singing praises to the Lord at midnight. And when you have to uh, stop to consider, uh, the next day may be their last day. And still they are singing praises to God. And uh, when it, they chosen to do it, uh, they could have made a major jailbreak. And uh, when the jailer comes in uh, at, and finds them still were they could have been, but didn't have to be. Uh, the apostles tell him, don't do yourself any harm uh, because he had reason to because if they escaped, his life is, is not worth anything. And so uh, he asked them. Obviously, uh, their singing, uh, their witness has touched his heart. The Lord has used that. And he asked, what must I do to be saved? And one thing you have to admit, the apostles didn't give, him, didn't give anybody a long drawn out uh, lesson on theology. They got straight to the point. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And so again, out of that, there were others who came to know the Lord. And when you think about that, you realize that uh, the Apostle Paul was right when he said to the church at Philippi, was it not, that the things that have happened to me have really resulted in the furtherance of the gospel. When Paul was persecuted, he understood that every time that happened, it was going to open a door for him to be a witness and a testimony to somebody that may not otherwise have heard the gospel. The things that have happened to me have resulted in the furtherance of the gospel. And so uh, he was not ashamed or afraid to suffer for the cause of Christ because he very well knew that any time 
he came to uh, face persecution, God was going to use it. Somebody was going to get to know the Lord. And Paul was not putting up a false front. Please understand, he was not, uh, it was not anything fake about it. It was just who he was. That was just his faith. And uh, that's just what he did. And so in chapter 17, uh, this is the story of the apostle taking the gospel to the church at Thessalonica. And uh, you know that uh, when he wrote two letters to the church at Thessalonica, he had some very praiseworthy things to say about them. But what you really find in chapter 17 is Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. That is when he saw the statues with the inscription to the unknown God. And he said to them, let me tell you about that God that you don't know. Which, by the way, it's not out of the realm of possibility. It's not an exaggeration whatsoever to say that they had hundreds, if not thousands, of gods. They had a god for everything. The god for the sun, god for the wind, god for the moon. But there was something that they could not explain. And lest a god be offended, they put up a statue that said to the unknown God, which you've heard it said, it was easier to find a statue than a man in Mars Hill. And so uh, what is interesting about this, if you read in the last verses of chapter 17 of the book of Acts, you will find it said, and by the way, these are the only responses that anyone can give when they hear the gospel. Some believed the Lord. Some of them believed. That's one, re one result. And God, uh, we wish, we pray for that result. The others said, we will hear more about this matter. That was just another way, a polite way of saying no. We'll put it off. And the third one was, they mocked him. They made no pretense whatsoever that they wanted to have nothing to do with the unknown God, with the God that Paul had just so detailed explained to them. Some believed, some put it off, and some mocked him. Some accepted Christ right there, right on the spot. God bless them. Some said, well, give us time to think about it. We'll get back with you later. Exactly what people do today. Well, I, I'm just not today. Maybe tomorrow, but not today. And the one thing about it, I've often said this, if Satan can talk you out of doing something today, he can talk you out of doing it tomorrow. And the others were not nearly as polite. They mocked the apostle. And so it was. In chapter 18, Paul is preaching to the church at Corinth. And as far as we know, he spent a year and a half or three years longer with the church at Corinth than probably any other church. And you do know from his writings that we've put it, put it this way, the church at Corinth was the church that had everything. But that was bad news. The church at Corinth was the church that had every problem a church can have. No exception. They had everything. But that's not, that, not to be envied. They had every problem a church can have. And by the way, 2 Corinthians, and I just throw this in as a footnote, there are two books in the Bible from a human standpoint that should not have been written. Now, please, I said from a human standpoint, one is the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. Had the generation that came out of Egypt gone into the land of Canaan, there would not have been any need for the book of Deuteronomy. There would not have been any need for the second law. But the generation that came out of Egypt perished in the wilderness. And so Moses under the leading of the Lord, 
had to make sure that the next generation had the law. So Deuteronomy, from a human standpoint, should not have been written. The other book is 2 Corinthians. Had the people at the church of Corinth not disputed the apostles' uh, right to be an apostle, to be a messenger of the Lord, there would not have been a need for 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians was written as a defense for Paul's ministry. And you'll hear him say, I don't want to talk about this, I don't want to brag, but you made me do it. I'm, I'm writing this to tell you that uh, I am authorized to do this. I'm called of God to do this. I am obligated. I, I have a divine mandate uh, to do this. And so he spoke to that church. And the interesting thing is that, and this is true today as it was then, in the worst of churches, people can still get saved. And they do. And I think God just has a way of reminding us that I'm still in charge. I'm still in control. And I can still do my work in places that may not really create an atmosphere for me to do my work. But God is still God. And God still works no matter what and no matter where. And so in chapter 19, we sing the song, do we not? We have heard the Macedonia call today. Send the light, send the light. And which, by the way, in the scripture, that Macedonia call came right after Paul wanted to go into another city. And he said the spirit didn't allow that. But then almost immediately, he gets the call, come over into Macedonia and help us. And so the people of Macedonia were, while there's not a book in the New Testament written to them, uh, it was a good church. They were good people. They were good witnesses. And then one I love is in chapter 20. Uh, there's a man by the name of Eutychus. And Eutychus is sitting up in the temple window, and Paul is preaching. And uh, I'm guessing probably about between 8 and 9 o'clock, Paul says, now finally, brethren, now let me wrap this up. And so about 11 or 12 o'clock, he's still wrapping it up. Eutychus is sitting in the window, and Eutychus falls out on the ground, that would kind of disrupt the average church service. Uh, if now you see me, now you don't kind of thing. But it's simply a matter of saying that the apostle was passionate about preaching. And for him, uh, time didn't really matter. It really did not matter. Then in chapter 22, he gives his testimony again. Three times he tells about what happened to him on the road to Damascus. And sufficient, suffice it to say that it would be good if each and every person had your testimony written down on paper and in your heart. If somebody should ask you about your relationship to the Lord, does not the scripture says, be always ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you? Uh, I, don't, I don't believe I was in the ministry at the point. But there's one event that I clearly remember. Uh, I've been around people <laughs> on secular jobs that didn't want to be close to them because they didn't want to hear anything about the Lord. They just didn't. 
But on one particular instance, someone asked me, what is it with you? You look like you don't have a care in the world. I said, well, that's not really true. I said, because I've got a wife and three children. And I said, so I do have a care in the world. But I said, I don't stay awake at night worrying about it. And all I can tell you is, and I don't know if or what part that I said had anything to do with it, except the person that asked me that question later gave their heart to the Lord. And so you've got to be ready. You want to be ready uh, to talk to people, give people an answer for the hope and talk to them. Uh, share your testimony. Uh, Paul, uh, Apostle Paul, he had his written down. He absolutely did. And so there were three others that I want to tell you about uh, Two of them, I beg your pardon, two others. Felix and Agrippa. Felix said, which by the way, this just goes to point out that everybody you witness to is not going to do what I just told you. The story is not always going to end that way. But you've done you what the Lord asked you to do. You've been faithful. You may not have been fruitful, but you've been faithful. You sowed the seed. Felix said, when I have a more convenient season, we'll talk about this. I don't know if that more convenient season ever stopped or not, ever happened or not, but I do know this. There are people today who are still waiting for a more convenient season. And the second was Agrippa, who said, almost all almost you have persuaded me to be a Christian and so the Apostle Paul ended his life in Rome waiting for his death and while he was there you've got to know <laughs> that everybody and best we know he was two years in the palace if you will but you've got to know that for two years, everybody who had any contact with the Apostle Paul heard the gospel. I can only imagine the poor, lonely soldiers who were chained to the Apostle Paul and couldn't go anywhere but listen to him talk about the Lord, talk about the Lord, talk about the Lord. Day in and day out, all day long, he talked about the Lord, and I can just hear them saying now, will you just please be quiet? <laughs> and so the apostle was all about the Lord. And I just ask you, I share this with you, to make this a matter of prayer, that people will be saved. It can still happen. It can still happen. We've had revival services in this church that in a week's time, 10 to 12 people came to know the Lord. And I just say to you, that can happen again. That can happen again. Just make it a matter of prayer that the Spirit of God will just bring conviction to the hearts of people and they'll come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. The book of Acts is an exciting book. It really is when you read it and you see what God was doing in that early church. But one thing you cannot deny, souls were being saved. And that's what makes this book so exciting. For those who have listened tonight and don't know Christ as your Savior, I ask you tonight, if you're listening by Facebook or YouTube, wherever you may be, give that, give that heart to the Lord. Let him have it today. Uh, you'll be amazed and pleased at what he does in your life. Nobody's ever told me I regret being a Christian. I've had a number of people who tell, told me I regret not doing it sooner. So don't put off any longer. Father, thank you tonight for the precious 
name of Jesus Christ, the saving name and the saving spirit of our Lord who is still working just as he was in that early church. May we never lose heart, but we never lose focus. May we never lose faith in what God can do when it comes to bringing people into the family of God. In the name of our Lord, we pray. Amen.